This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. And welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight, especially just before Christmas. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii continues to celebrate 20 years of following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education, as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. We'd also like to encourage those of you who are not yet members, and even those of you who are not yet even vegetarians, to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. Members receive an informative newsletter, are informed of popular social events, and receive discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and at Down to Earth. Some of our most recent social events have included dine-outs at Loving Hut on South King Street and at Phuket Thai, as well as at our spectacular Thanksgiving Eve Buffet at Govinda's. Please be sure to sign up for a membership before you leave tonight to start taking advantage of these and other great discounts right away. Please be sure to stay here after our program and sample some delicious vegan foods provided by the generosity of down-to-earth natural foods. We're videotaping tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Alelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website, vsh.org, to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight, Vesanto Melina. Ms. Melina is a registered dietitian and co-author of Becoming Raw with Brenda Davis and the Raw Food Revolution Diet with Cherie Saria and Brenda Davis, as well as the best-selling nutrition classics, Becoming Vegan, Becoming Vegetarian, The New Becoming Vegetarian, Raising Vegetarian Children, and the Food Allergy Survival Guide. Vesanto taught nutrition at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and at Seattle's Bastyr University. She also co-authored the joint position paper of the American Dietetic Association and Dietitians of Canada. Her presentation tonight is entitled, Raw Food Diets, What's True, What's Not? Please welcome the Santo Melina. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Can you hear from the back? I got this right. Oh, good. I'm from Canada, but I've been many, many places, and am very excited by really the inspirational changes that are happening in so many countries across North America and in Europe. Uh, my partner Cam, who I'd like to thank for a lot of the help he's done in this presentation and being here too, we're just in Europe, and there, there are people in 
all parts of North America and Europe that have been moving towards plant-based diets and then also exploring raw food diets. And I also, by the way, want to thank the Vegetarian Society for uh, bringing me here and for your interest. I was just on Maui last a couple of days ago, and people are also very interested in raw diets and vegan diets. So what we're going to look at here is about raw vegan diets and the interest, do you have to be 100% raw, just all the kind of questions that come up. And there are, of course, a lot of different opinions on this. So we'll be looking at the science behind it. Because personally, I'm a dietitian. I've taught at university. I actually started teaching at university in 1965, so quite a while ago. I've gone through many, many changes in my own thinking. And then I've become vegetarian with time and become vegan with time. With raw definitions, what is raw food eating? You'll find there are really quite a few opinions on this, but when we look at the literature, at what is commonly accepted most widely, we find that a raw food diet typically means that 75% or more of your food by weight is raw, uncooked. And that means it hasn't been above 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this line, 118 degrees Fahrenheit, is a rather dubious line. I'll tell you, some of the enzymes are not inactivated until well above that. One we'll talk about myrosinase is at its most active at 140. So there, there really isn't a need for this set line. But anyway, this is what's commonly accepted. And the high raw diet is 50 to 74% so you, about half of the food that you eat, or, or somewhat more than that, is raw. Fruitarian, 75% or more fruit, and high fruit, 50 to 74%. So then there's a stream of thinking that actually came from Northern Europe. Anne Wigmore was from Lithuania. The Finns seem to have quite an interest in raw food. But they, they didn't have access to kind of fruit people have in Hawaii or in warmer countries, in the Mediterranean countries. So what they did was a lot of sprouting, a lot of fermenting, soaked oats, fermented foods. And so we have this living food diet. And some of the very interesting research that was done, for example, in the early 90s, and Quite a series of extremely important research came from Finland, where people were doing raw food diets. And it's kind of surprising, because it'd be chilly up there. But they did a lot of fermented foods. And then there's the natural hygiene school of raw food. So in our book, Becoming Raw, which is kind of a new bestseller, it's really become very popular, we looked at all the science, but we looked at all these different schools of thinking. The natural hygiene, for example, came from Herbert Shelton and advocates food combining, which is kind of in a way food separating, like it's not eating certain things together. And that was mainly raw. Now, raw is really popular in many, many places, as I mentioned. For example, here's a NASCAR driver who had stage four cancer and found out that when he switched to a, a raw diet that he's been healthy for the last 10 years, 11 years now. We find that dietitians are getting interested. I know here in the audience we've had a number of dietetic students, young dietitians. It's really become very, very popular, whether people are 100% raw or they're just um, inching that way. So what we'll be looking at some of the controversy and really, there's no way of eating that varies more from mainstream than raw food diets. There are a number of issues that people disagree on, even among the raw food movement advocates themselves. You can have opinions about enzymes, about food combining, and people certainly don't agree. What we were interested in, in writing Becoming Raw, and also the Raw Food Revolution Diet, which we did with a wonderful raw food chef, Sherry Soria, is we wanted to find out what the science was. What's really been backed up? You know, can you cure your cancer? 
with a raw food diet because of course there's tremendous interest it's a very very important area can you lose weight successfully is it a good way to do that do you have to eat a hundred percent raw to be following a suitable diet what does what the science say so the issues that we'll be covering tonight first of all here's one big one are plant enzymes which are present in food before it's cooked. Enzymes are typically inactivated the hotter they get. Are they essential to human health? Do we really need them? Are all cooked foods toxic? Can we get enough vitamin B12 from plant foods or from internal production? Sometimes people just want to have a real natural diet. They don't want to have a bunch of pills that they have to eat. And so can you do, how can you do it? Do you get enough vitamin B12? What does the science say there? And are the following foods healthful or harmful? Here we're looking at buckwheat greens, alfalfa sprouts, raw mushrooms, and sea vegetables. And can raw foods cure chronic disease or reverse chronic disease? And are plant enzymes essential to human health? Do we need these? Like when you bite into a papaya or have some wheatgrass juice, carrot juice, the, the enzymes in there, are they doing you a lot of good? Do you need them? The raw food thinking is that food enzymes are vital to human health. In fact, that your body supply is rather limited, you're going to run out and you need those enzymes in raw foods. And they provide the strongest argument for raw overcooked foods. Medical textbooks, on the other hand, don't give a nod to, to plant enzymes. They'll say that when food hits your stomach, the hydrochloric acid inactivates those enzymes and that's the end of the story. So we looked at the science and we actually covered 1,200 different research articles from the peer-reviewed medical literature in doing this Becoming Raw book. And we found out that plant enzymes are possibly helpful, but not essential. What we found was that there are several ways they help. First of all, they will convert two protective phytochemicals, these tremendously powerful substances that can protect us from chronic disease, into their active form. So plant enzymes will do that, and they'll do it in raw foods. Plant enzymes can also aid the digestive process before food gets down to the stomach. And this is not insignificant, although it's, it's uh, not the whole story. So the two enzymes that convert protective phytochemicals into their active forms are first of all myrosinase, which is in cruciferous vegetables. These are in the, the, the flowers are in the shape of a cross, any botanists here know? And that's vegetables in the cabbage family, broccoli, Napa cabbage, kale, radishes are in that group. And the other enzyme is alanase in the allium vegetables, these that have the sulfury smell, onion, garlics, leeks. These are two enzymes that we've, we know are important. So these are two examples and two examples of phytochemicals. There probably are more, but these are ones we know about right now. And with myrosinase, for example, it converts glucinolates to their active forms. Then we have a substance that is a potent anti-cancer agent. So when you eat foods in this family, the cruciferous vegetables, you think of all the cabbage family, the, the green juices you might drink, things like this. You have a very potent anti-cancer agent present. Cam and I had the opportunity, for example, to go down to the Optimum Health Center in, well, we went to Ann Wigmore's Institute in Puerto Rico and could see people that had come to get over, um, cure themselves from certain diseases, or in some cases, young people who wanted to protect themselves from diseases that were in their families. Now, unfortunately, a lot of these institutes, Gabriel Cousins, the Optimum Health Institute, they have not published in the peer reviewed medical literature. But anyway, they haven't, for example, said we've had 500 people and, you know, 250 of them got reversed their disease condition that they came with. 
you know, there, there just hasn't been that kind of study. They'll tell you about two or three that where it really worked wonderfully. Now, with the alanase cancer fighters, the conversion that happens is allian it gets converted to allicin, the active form. And it's antimicrobial, antithrombotic, it can prevent clotting, it's lipid lowering, antiarthritic, and anti-cancer. So these are very powerful substances. When you eat these things raw, uh, there's tremendous benefit. Some of you may know that there are also components in garlic that are better when they're cooked a little bit too. So it's, that's not the whole story that, that you have to eat it raw. So you get benefits when it's cooked as well. Science says that plant enzymes are released when raw food is juiced, blended, pureed, chopped, or chewed. So when we do make juices, and you know, a lot of these institutes that are doing such good work in helping people who have serious disease conditions, they, they give juices, they do a lot of pureed foods, phytochemicals are much better absorbed in this case. But if you also chew your food well, uh, how many people really take the time to chew their food here? Let's see if some of you do that. Some, of, some people have really made a made good point of that. And that kind of thing can be a tremendous benefit. Uh, most of us kind of wolf our food down. And in that case, you're better off to blend it or puree it because you're getting a bit of the job done that way. Um, cooking, on the other hand, will destroy enzymes, reduce this conversion, and thus you won't get these protective effects. Now, food enzymes can aid in the digestive process, as I mentioned, but they will work until the food gets down to the upper part of the stomach. Then it goes into a very acidic section below that. But it can take up to 45 minutes between when you actually put the food in your mouth and when it gets into the acid. So that's quite a while that the plant enzymes can be active. So we were very, very interested. We talked to people who were doing digestive research. I mean, it's amazing to me, but as a dietitian, I had really not learned that much about digestion. It's kind of shocking. But now, after the stomach acid, the food reaches the intestine, which is really where digestion happens. And there is very little enzymatic activity from plant enzymes after that point. A little bit if a cell gets through, but mostly it doesn't make much of a contribution. So the contribution of plant enzymes is in fact very small. For example, in carrot juice, you've got a starch enzyme, amylase, and it has 20 to 30 units per liter of activity. And in saliva, on the other hand, your body's saliva that it, that it makes, it has amylase activity of 200,000 units per liter. So pre-digestion, what happens from the plant enzymes, really makes a relatively small contribution compared to what your body does. Now, the second big question, are cooked foods toxic? What science says here, some raw food advocates say, Cooked food is poison, and really draw a line there. But science, when we looked at it very, very carefully, and there were a lot of studies looking at individual foods, you know, is it of value? Is it, are, do you still get vitamins? Do you still get minerals? Insignificant amounts from these. The cooking methods proved to be safe in certain cases. Steaming. Some people like to have, even though they have a mainly raw diet, they'll have a steamed yam, something like that. They'll boil something. They'll have a lentil soup. They want to have some higher protein foods. They'll have a bean salad. Um, add cooked chickpeas to something at the salad bar. And it turns out that these are really very safe and in some cases actually beneficial. These ways of preparing food can retain nutrients, minimize the harmful byproducts, and reduce anti-nutrients. For example, in, if you ate raw chickpeas or raw kidney beans, there are anti-protein factors there that can make your body very uncomfortable, make you feel sick, and actually have a negative impact on digestion. So some cooking, though, 
does have very harmful byproducts. And we'll go over these right now. Cooking can reduce nutrients and phytochemicals. And, and there are a lot of phytochemicals. I mean, they have just a vast, vast array. And w these are what protect us from chronic disease to a tremendous extent. So cooking can damage these. And also, cooking can produce some very harmful byproducts. And we'll go over what these are. The degree of loss or damage just depends on how hot you get with the cooking and the temperature, the time, and what the cooking method is. So cooking losses, first of all, minerals will survive very, very high cooking temperatures. I mean, you can cook something to an ash and the minerals are still in a form that your body could use. But if you're cooking something, and then you throw away the cooking water, many of the minerals have leached out into that cooking water. So if you make a soup, for example, you've still got that and you're still consuming it. Vitamins, on the other hand, are much more readily lost with heat. And if you have lengthy cooking, you'll lose 50 to 80%. I mean, you could lose practically all, depending on how long things went. If you're doing brief steaming or other cooking, you'd have losses under 30%. And for some people, like people who are eating raw and high raw diets, are getting plenty of, of these valuable minerals. And often, the, your intakes are sufficiently high that having a 30% loss isn't any particular, like you can't absorb that much anyway. Phytochemicals, we get losses with increased temperature, time, and when you dispose of the cooking water, they're so water soluble, many of them. But they turn out, this is an interesting thing, to be more available from juice. And I was kind of intrigued because people in the raw food world, people like Ann Wigmore, have been advocating juices for a long time and just doing it from, from intuition. The science has just come out in the last few years because the papers we were looking at were very, very recent. Now, carotenoids, the whole story isn't that you absorb better from juice or from raw, because certain carotenoids are more available from cooked foods. Many men have been aware and pleased to find that tomato sauce on something when it's been cooked is a good, contains valuable anti-prostate cancer phytochemicals. So here's about some of the potentially harmful byproducts that you have from cooking. First of all, heterocyclic amines. And I'll go over these one by one. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, so PAHs, HCAs were the first one. Advanced glycation end products, AGEs, and acrylamide. So these four nasty little critters. And they can do a lot of damage. When you hear me talking about this, though, don't think like if you've ever eaten one of these things, you're going to be in very poor health. I think we need to look at it as a balance. The, the protective qualities in our diet can actually overpower the negative ones. But the heterocyclic amines, these are uh, formed at very high temperatures in meat, poultry, fish, eggs. Here we've got things barbecuing right behind. And they involve a component in muscle tissue called creatinine, uh, condensing with amino acids. And these were added to the list of cancer-causing agents by the National Institute of Health. And they don't add something lightly to that list. So they are clearly uh, known to increase our risk of breast, colorectal, pancreatic, and stomach cancers. Okay, the next advanced glycation end products. Now we're seeing some pretty familiar foods here. Right? I mean, people are eating these things all the time without realizing what damage is being done. There's some browned animal products in the back here. But AGEs are products of a browning reaction. And when sugar interacts with amino acids, they form in grilled and fried meats. They can be in other browned foods as well. Look at the, the damage these can cause. Im, impair the immune system function, accelerate aging, contribute to the progression of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, kidney disease, eye diseases, nerve damage, and Alzheimer's disease.
So these advanced glycation end products, the broiled frankfurter, for example, is uh, the highest on the list. And if it's just boiled, um, you cut your damage by about 30%. You can have grilled or fried meats. And notice that you can also get, get AGEs in grilled or fried tofu. So it isn't just in animal products here. And you can, can have very small amounts of these forming in cooked fruits and vegetables, but it's relatively minor amounts. The next thing, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These form at very high temperatures, again, and when we char something, for example, when we eat toast that's really, really dark, practically burnt or burnt, and some people will do that, it's, it's really better to avoid products like that, but it's also in many animal products and fried foods. And these are linked to lung, skin, and genitourinary cancers. And the last of these areas is acrylamide. The picture here is potato chips. And these form in high carbohydrate foods. So all these snack foods that are so red readily available in all kinds of corner stores uh, potatoes have an amino acid called asparagine and these are one of the culprits that will react to form acrylamide. So this was classified as probably carcinogenic. It hasn't quite got the blacklisting of the other, earlier ones. So these are all good foods to avoid, but it's surprising because some of the items that are listed, for example, postum, I mean I remember when I was a kid, that used to be thought of as a pretty healthy thing. Now, of course, you're not going to eat that much postum, just a little spoonful. But anyway, you can get, find acrylamides in all sorts of carbohydrate foods that have been toasted or browned. Now, the next issue that we're looking at is can we get enough vitamin B12 from plant foods or internal production? And this is a really interesting area. I've been, I've been quite intrigued with vitamin B12 because personally I've been vegetarian about 32 years and vegan 17 since we started writing our Becoming Vegetarian, Becoming Vegan series. I turned vegan at that point and, you know, really got interested in B12. You know, where can you get it from? And how come we suddenly would need to be taking supplements on a vegan diet? You know, what, what's the story here? So I'll tell you the story. Raw food diet without supplements or fortified foods, getting enough B12 is possible but very unlikely. And there have been a number of studies on raw food diets that looked at how people were doing in terms of vitamin B12. And they found that the, the vegans who were not taking supplements regularly or fortified foods that had B12 in them were consistently low. The average B12 levels were about a quarter to a half what the recommended levels are. This is something, if you wonder yourself, it's really worth getting checked out. Tell your physician that you've been following an entirely plant-based diet or raw diet and just get your levels checked and then you can be reassured. So we'll go over a few of the plant foods that are not reliable B12 sources and that are sometimes listed on websites, on raw food websites, brochures, as being possibilities. Now, first of all, seaweed can include active and inactive or analog forms of vitamin B12. And the, the inactive forms can actually interfere with the absorption of the good forms, the valuable forms. So this is why you get trouble here. It, it's actually a lot cheaper t to just use a supplement. I know some people in, in the raw food world have made me laugh. They said, well, if a bug falls into my smoothie, I'm glad because there's a bit of B12. Well, that's true, but it's not, I'm not vegan anymore. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Okay, so our body's B12 production actually is not enough. We can produce a little bit in our saliva, especially if we have poor oral hygiene, but again, it isn't enough to rely on as a B12 source. Our absorption site for B12 is way down the small intestine, but we also produce 
vitamin B12, but it's further down our intestine, in the large intestine. So uh, this, in summary, there's, these are not sufficient to meet our needs. You get a tiny little crumb of B12. Well, we only need a tiny little crumb, really, but it gets an even smaller proportion. B12 stores, this is an interesting one. I mean, some people do say, well, look at I haven't had a B12 supplement for ages, and I've been on a raw diet or a vegan diet. But it can take a long time to run out of B12. Some people are efficient recyclers. People have been known to go for even 20 years and not get into trouble. And then they got into big trouble because the, the symptoms are quite drastic. Most people, it can last two or three years. And then in the studies that have been done, which were typically of people who have been on raw diets for, or vegan diets for three years, something like that, levels were starting to go down, down, down. But they hadn't completely run out, so they had extremely bad symptoms. Now, who gets into real trouble is infants, because they haven't even had a chance to build up their stores in the first place. So you'll see nerve damage, seizures, and so on happening at a few months. And I do consultations with people and have lately had quite a number of people who are going through pregnancy or doing raw diet thinking in terms of their families. This is a really important area not to set up an infant for this disaster. What does B12 deficiency look like? There's four different areas. First of all, our cells, they don't mature properly. They get bigger, 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 and then they don't divide as they should. And so they don't carry oxygen properly. You get weak, you get tired, you get depressed irritable. Then there's nerve damage and that can lead to memory loss and confusion. Actually one of the areas of confusion is something that happens with seniors in, in senior centers. B12 deficiency can happen and somebody be confused and then if they get a B12 injection then they'll suddenly the confusion goes away and they're, they're um, mentally alert and aware again. There can be gastrointestinal disturbances and diarrhea. Also, the last area is high homocysteine. Now, this is an indicator, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So one of the rather troublesome areas is that some people who are on wonderful diets otherwise that would help your heart health tremendously undermine the whole thing by not having enough B12 in their diet. And so that just balances things that would have been, otherwise you've got a wonderful diet for good heart health. So don't mess with B12 and just make sure that you have some reliable sources. If you're experimenting around to see what yours is, you can certainly get lab testing done. Some of the reliable B12 sources that there are are multivitamin mineral supplements that can be consumed daily, fortified foods, there's a number of veggie meats, rice milks and so on, but these are not raw foods. And there's also nutritional yeast pictured here, but there's, it's just a brand, Red Star, that fortifies it. They actually grow it on a B12 enriched medium. And if you have a daily supplement, you would have about 10 micrograms a day. Your absorption's more efficient when you just eat a little bit. Then you need about four micrograms a day. And if you have a supplement twice a week, because with this big amount, our percentage absorption goes way, way down, you'd need 1,000 micrograms twice a week. So these are some good ways to get B12. And then you can just relax and know you're on a tremendously healthy diet. Now, the foods that we wanted to explore that are, you know, should these be eaten raw? First of all, buckwheat greens. It's an interesting one. These are sometimes used for juicing. I know at the Hippocrates Institute and Wigmore Institute in Puerto Rico, they were using buckwheat greens for juicing. A number of different people do. It's been found, though, that some individuals, especially with light skin, will have extreme sensitivity to sunlight, irritation on their skin, itching, sensitivity to cold. So it hasn't affected everybody in the same way, but some individuals do react to buckwheat greens. The research has shown that this is really quite common with animals, that if they're eating sprouted 
green buckwheat shoots, they can develop something called phagopyrism. It wasn't well known in humans because humans weren't eating these too much until recently. So should buckwheat greens be avoided? The answer is yes. But it doesn't mean if you've had some juice with buckwheat greens in it, it's going to be a tremendous problem at that level. What about buckwheat groats or seeds? Often these are used, for example, I've had some tremendous raw pizzas in uh, California and just all, you have too. <laughs> yeah, lots of people, they're, they're great. Well, it turns out that the buckwheat groats, they have such tiny, tiny, minuscule amounts that they don't pose a threat at all. So you don't need to worry about that. When buckwheat is sprouted, phagopyrin doesn't develop for a little while. It, if you grow them in the dark, they won't develop this greening. And if you rinse them, you can get rid of a lot of it. In a practical way, what seemed to make sense to me is, is to use them for things like raw pizza crusts, but not to use them in juices. Because there's plenty of wonderful other greens to use in juices, and you don't really need those ones. Alfalfa sprouts now. Alfalfa sprouts, the really main problem with them, they've been associated with lupus. and uh, there has been some suggestion that everyone should avoid these sprouts. It turns out that alfalfa sprouts contain small amounts of an amino acid that is similar to L-arginine, it's called L-cannabinine, and it can replace L-arginine, which we need, in proteins, but then you end up with a non-functional protein, so that's a problem. This can stimulate or worsen the symptoms of lupus. So the message here is that the L-cannabinine content of sprouts is low. Typically people don't need to worry about using sprouts at all, but you wouldn't want to use several cups a day of uh, alfalfa sprouts. Now people with lupus should avoid consuming alfalfa sprouts, but otherwise a raw vegan diet and a vegan diet is a wonderful diet for somebody with lupus, but just not to include large amounts of the sprouts. Now mushrooms, good, not good. You know, there are a lot of kinds of mushrooms, and some of them are tremendously toxic. Right away, you eat one, you'll be dead, you know. So it turns out that raw mushrooms contain a substance, the, even the edible ones that we commonly eat, the people have eaten for many, many years, they have a substance called garotene that is toxic and possibly carcinogenic. Raw shiitake mushrooms, on a, there'll be a little bit more on this so you can see it more, they contain formaldehyde. And in Japan, people are eating raw shiitakes. Certain numbers of the people in the medical literature related to Japan turn out to have dermatitis and photosensitivity. So not everybody. And it seems we do have some variability about how we react to these things. Now, if you cook them, it turns out that you eliminate these toxic compounds. If you cook, you'll pretty well get rid of it. Refrigeration, if you keep your, your um, mushrooms in the fridge for several weeks, uh, the diminishing effect can be like half of it will be uh, removed. And you can also soak and dehydrate mushrooms. How effective this is has not yet been quantified. Shiitake mushrooms, it turns out that if you cook for about six minutes, you'll significantly reduce the formaldehyde to safe levels. Somebody in Scotland decided he was going to get his vitamin D from mushrooms because if you eat, there's very small amounts of vitamin D in mushrooms, but he was eating so much he got really sick. You can't rely on raw mushrooms as your vitamin D source on a raw diet, even in a Scotland where there's not limited amounts of sunlight. Okay, So the take-home message here, eating raw mushrooms, although it's common, it may not be risk-free. So don't eat large amounts on a regular basis. But if you do want to eat them raw, the safest way seems to marinate them in acids, you know, lemon juice, vinegar, and dehydrate them. And minimize or avoid raw shiitake mushrooms. And I must say, this is quite recent research because we even have one recipe in our raw food revolution diet for a, a raw shiitake salad dressing. 
So, and that was that was written about four years ago. So, anyway, sea vegetables. There's some concern that particularly these two, hijiki and kelp, are sources of heavy metals, particularly arsenic and a poor form of arsenic. So sea vegetables turn out to be like little sponges and they will take up heavy metals from the water. They also, they'll take up good metals, minerals like calcium and I've, hijiki has been very famous as a wonderful source of calcium but it turns out that it also is taking up some metals that we don't want. And as you know, we've been really using the oceans as a dumping ground for a lot of problematic substances. So the joint FAO and World Health Organization set an upper limit, which would be about 1,000 micrograms for a person that weighs about 150 pounds, or proportionally more or less, depending on body weight. It turns out that this amount could be in a half to a quarter cup of raw hijiki. About 50% of the arsenic is lost when hijiki is soaked and then the water discarded. So there have been government advisories against use of hijiki in Canada, Britain, Hong Kong and New Zealand. The health agencies have advised against using this. Which now kelp supplements, there was someone first of all in California who reported arsenic to toxicity after they were using significant amounts, you know, just regular use of kelp sub sub supplements. And they were doing this to get some iodine. You know, they were just, well, here's a healthy supplement. I'll get my iodine from this source. The, it turns out that the kelp supplements can also include arsenic. And so it's important to contact the company and find out if they've tested for arsenic and what their levels are. So with hijiki, you know, use a, a small amount once in a while if you like to, but not more than that, not use that on a regular basis. Check with the company. So in general, sea vegetables can absorb minerals and do so in moderation. Well, I said some negative things about raw foods, you know what, that you have to be careful for. But it's really important to keep this in perspective. I mean, otherwise, this is a very, very healthful way to eat. If you look at the, some of the alternative diets, a raw food diet that's high raw, mainly raw, you're just inching your way towards eating more f raw foods, it's a very, very good way to eat and a lot better than other people are doing. So we'll look at can raw foods re reverse chronic disease. The research here comes predominantly from three countries. I mentioned that there had been some very interesting research in Finland in the early 90s and we got to communicate with some of the researchers while we were writing Becoming Raw and in the United States there's been several different places, the Hallelujah Acres group that were exploring high raw diets. What we find is that there have been some real victories, clear evidence of benefits from raw vegan diets. And these have shown up for rheumatoid arthritis, for fibromyalgia, and for overweight and obesity. There's also limited or suggestive evidence for raw vegan diets in the areas of cancer, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes. So we'll go over these different areas because they're, they're really quite fascinating. And this is an extremely new area in terms of nutrition, in terms of health. So the studies in Finland were people on living food diets. They were soaking and sprouting oats, they were fermenting foods, they had actually a fair number of sea vegetables in their diets and they found on raw vegan diets that had a lot of these living foods, fermented foods, that there was significant reduction in morning stiffness, joint swelling, pain and other symptoms. This was not just the reports, the subjective reports they did, there were also lab markers that indicated improvements. What also showed up was that their fecal flora, the 400 or so different types of bacteria in their intestine changed as, as they changed their diets. 
and their blood cholesterol levels improved and antioxidant status. Now, when they went back to an omnivore diet, included animal products, dairy, all that sort of thing, their symptoms resumed. The benefits disappeared. So that was, those are very interesting studies. There were studies on about 20 people who were, they were small groups, but they did have control groups in these. With fibromyalgia, here, here again, there was a, the Hallelujah Acres group looked at this, and also people in Finland. And again, they were small groups. They went on for a significant period of time. You can imagine it's not that easy to get people to go on this and really stay on it for all these months. But what they found with fibromyalgia was that 75% showed a significant improvement, and there was a 46% reduction of symptoms with fibromyalgia. Uh, similarly, in Finland, they put people on a living food diet and they had big improvements in their pain scores, morning st stiffness, and th things got worse again when they went back to an omnivore diet. And I haven't seen arthritis associations picking up on this and mentioning that in programs, but it would seem a really valuable area. Also, of course, when people went on these diets, they got rid of a lot of the allergens they followed. They get rid of the wheat, the, the gluten-containing foods, many of the other triggers, the dairy. So that was quite interesting. Raw vegan diets have plenty of anti-inflammatory compounds. They're low in inflammatory compounds. The gut flora change. They also eliminate these culprits that cause food allergies and generally result in weight loss which puts weight on your joints. So anyway, there, there were a number of clear reasons. So there's a very good plus for raw vegan diets. Overweight and obesity. The raw diets tend to promote weight loss and that has been shown in study after study. And people typically lose about 9% of their body weight. Now, why are raw vegan diets so successful? Well, one of the areas is because foods that are raw, plant foods, are low in calories per gram. Like you can, you can eat a huge salad, salad that's like that big, and it has as many calories as a little pat of butter, like a little small amount. So you, when you start replacing things like that, it, you, you get, you're well fed. You have to learn how to do it, of course, but, and make it pleasurable, but it, you can work really well. One of the other things that I think is very helpful with raw diets is that you actually draw a line. Okay, I'm going to eat these things, but not those things. So it keeps you away from bakeries and your lattes and all that kind of thing. So it, it helps people. Like with, with something like Alcoholics Anonymous, people just say no alcohol. But with food, it's really hard to draw the line, you know, just draw a clear line. And, and so this has been helpful for people on raw diets. Calorie dense foods such as meats, ice cream, flour products are just eliminated. With cancer, now we're into the areas that are not quite as clear cut. There have been three studies that uh, there have not been studies that showed, okay, this many people were on raw diets and the cancer risk dropped. There have been studies that showed reduced cancer risk when they looked at metabolic markers. Uh, they had less damage to their DNA, better protection against DNA damage, lower levels of growth factor, and with the big cancer studies, the American Institute of Cancer Research and the World Cancer Foundation, a number have looked at raw and cooked vegetables. What they do is look at studies from Russia, Italy, just all over the world, United States, Europe, and they find that raw and cooked vegetables are very protective. Vegetables turn out to be tremendously protective, but the findings are even more consistent for raw than for cooked. The reasons for this protection against cancer, so we're talking about protection against the development of cancer. The advantage of raw foods is actually related to the disadvantages of cooking. With cooking, you lose vitamin C, phytochemicals, you disable those two enzymes that were cancer protectors you change the physical structure of food so that the fiber 
that could bind and carry away carcinogens is decreased. With cooking, of course, you can produce some of those nasty components, the HCAs and PAHs. So these are, are just postulated to be some of the advantages of raw diets for, in relation to cancer. Cardiovascular disease. Now, we have excellent evidence that plant-based diets are protective. We know that. Vegan diets, you, you, you just can find terrific evidence to support a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease for plant-based diets. But for raw diets, there's really limited evidence. Some of the metabolic markers are looking, looking good for raw food diets. They find, for example, from the American studies, that the vegans had lower blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and some other markers of heart health. In studies in Germany and Finland, they also found some reduced risk indicators. But they also showed that because of the high homocysteine levels, people were not in such a favorable position, unfortunately. If, if people would make sure they had enough vitamin B12, they'd be in very good shape here. So a lack of several nutrients can undermine, in general, the benefits of a raw vegan diet. First of all, not getting enough vitamin B12, not getting enough vitamin D, so that's linked to a number of different problematic areas. And there has been, of course, as I'm sure you're aware from looking at newspapers and TV and so on, pretty lively interest in vitamin D, what should our levels be, and so on. There's tremendous controversy, opinion, all sorts of things about vitamin D. And omega-3 fatty acids uh, lack is linked with a number of health problems, potentially. But we can, we can easily handle all of these areas, and then we have a terrific diet, whether you're choosing vegan or raw vegan. With diabetes, one U.S. report showed raw food vegans to have favorable fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and insulin sensitivity compared with people eating um, standard Western diets. So Gabriel Cousins, if you've been looking at some of the raw research, he's, been, he's put out a video, some interesting things he's doing with type 1 diabetics. But it, it is clearly a benefit for people with type 2 diabetes and possibly with uh, type 1. Raw vegan diets naturally have a low glycemic load. People are not eating the foods that cause these spikes and crashes. The refined grains, the high sugars, the starchy vegetables are largely eliminated. Grains, if people are eating them at all, they're sprouting them, eating them whole, and they're rich in anti-inflammatory fiber, antioxidants, phytochemicals. So you've got a lot of protective things here. The bottom line is that raw vegan diets offer powerful potential and we haven't had enough good research to really show what's going on. For type 2, it's, it's looking very good. But I have met three people who were, were type 1 diabetics who were exploring raw diets and, and doing really quite well. They'd reduced their insulin levels significantly, like down to 10, 20 percent. Protection here, the raw vegan diets could be tremendous protectors and they eliminate, they just have a lot going for them. You don't get the cholesterol, trans fatty acids, you avoid a lot of allergens, you've got less saturated fat, you don't have those damaging components from cooking, they're anti-inflammatory. I mean, there's just a lot of real pluses on raw diets. Now here is an example of a raw D vegan day that is nutritionally adequate. And in our books, Becoming Raw and the Raw Food Revolution Diet, I, I worked out menus. Sometimes it would take me a week to do a menu, like figure out, okay, we want to get every single nutrient, you know, all the magnesium, the, the zinc, the, meet the recommended iron levels. Um, even though these recommendations have a safety factor, I still wanted to meet them with a raw vegan diet. And so here's an example of one of the menus. And this is a simple one, one that you could do traveling or with hardly any preparation. Somebody came up 
just before the talk today and said, do I have to get a blender to be on raw diet? Well, no, you don't. You can eat really simply. And here's an example. So here is breakfast right there. And there's a little vitamin B12 right there. <laughs> <laughs> or your supplement, whatever you're doing. You could put these things into a blender and make a smoothie out of them, or you could just eat them like that. And there's some kale, blueberries, some fruit. Then for lunch, you could have... In this day, there's a lot of pea pods. I actually found this a good traveling menu. And you could eat some fruit, some figs, some seeds, good calcium sources. And then for supper, there's a, or a soup, rather, um, a tahini dressing and some raw veggies. And you can have this just really simple. But this day had 1,600 50 calories. Now you could, most people need more calories than this, so you could add all kinds of avocados and whatever else you wanted. It has enough protein for a pretty big person, calcium at recommended levels, iron, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, and then you include your supplement for B12. Benefits of adopting a raw vegan diet, well, the good news gets even better. It's good for your health, but the benefits go way beyond. You have powerful protection for the planet with about a 20th of the, of the resources when you have a plant-based diet. And if you're not cooking, you use even fewer of the resources. So you're really doing a big vote for love for the planet. You don't use the animal agriculture that's so devastating to our ecosystems. You don't damage, do the amount of climate change damage, uh, water use desertification, deforestation. You promote reverence for life. Every year in North America, over 10 billion land animals, they don't even count the fish as numbers, but <laughs> there's a lot there too, are slaughtered and they're raised in rather tragic conditions. All of you here have expressed just by coming, you're caring and the thinking man must oppose all cruel customs, no matter how deeply rooted in tradition and surrounded by a halo. When we have a choice, we must avoid bringing torment and injury into the life of another. Until he extends his circle of compassion to all living things, man will not find peace. And this was from Albert Schweitzer. Whether you choose to adopt a fully raw or partly raw and wh wherever you are on the spectrum or if you're just inching your way towards more plant-based it's a very positive step and you're bringing some wonderful wonderful energy to the planet making these choices so I'd like to thank you Thank you very much, Vasanto Melino, for giving us so much fascinating and authoritative information that we can all use, whether or not we wish to pursue an all-raw diet. And then we invite you to join us in the courtyard for some of those delicious vegan foods provided for us by Down to Earth. Have a safe return home, everyone. Good night. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website, at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.
118 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this line, 118 degrees Fahrenheit, is a rather dubious line. I'll tell you, some of the enzymes are not inactivated until well above that. One we'll talk about myrosinase is at its most active at 140. So there, there really isn't a need for this set line. But anyway, this is what's commonly accepted. And the high raw diet is 50 to 74% so you, about half of the food that you eat, or, or somewhat more than that, is raw. Fruitarian, 75% or more fruit, and high fruit, 50 to 74%. So then there's a stream of thinking that actually came from Northern Europe. Anne Wigmore was from Lithuania. The Finns seem to have quite an interest in raw food. But they, they didn't have access to kind of fruit people have in Hawaii or in warmer countries, in the Mediterranean countries. So what they did was a lot of sprouting, a lot of fermenting, soaked oats, fermented foods. And so we have this living food diet. And some of the very interesting research that was done, for example, in the early 90s, and quite a series of extremely important research came from Finland where people were doing raw food diets and it's kind of surprising because it'd be chilly up there but they did a lot of fermented foods and then there's the natural high This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. And welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight, especially just before Christmas. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii continues to celebrate 20 years of following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. We'd also like to encourage those of you who are not yet members and even those of you who are not yet even vegetarians to join the Vegetarian Society tonight. Members receive an informative newsletter. Our people in all parts of North America and Europe that have been moving towards plant-based diets and then also exploring raw food diets. And I also, by the way, want to thank the Vegetarian Society for uh, bringing me here and for your interest. I was just on Maui last a couple of days ago and people are also very interested in raw diets and vegan diets. So what we're going to look at here is about raw vegan diets and the interest, do you have to be 100% raw, just all the kind of questions that come up. And there are of course a lot of different opinions on this. So we'll be looking at the science behind it. Because personally, I'm a dietitian. I've taught at university. I actually started teaching at university in 1965. So quite a while ago, I've gone through many, many changes in my own thinking, and then I've become vegetarian with time and become vegan with time. With raw definitions, what is raw food eating? You'll find there are really quite a few opinions on this, but when we look at the literature, at what is commonly accepted most widely, we find that a raw food diet typically means that 75% or more of your food by weight is raw, uncooked. And that means it hasn't been above 180. Informed of popular social events and received discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and at Down to Earth. Some of our most recent social events have included dine-outs at Loving Hut on South King Street and at Phuket Thai, as well as at our spectacular Thanksgiving Eve buffet 
at Govindas. Please be sure to sign up for a membership before you leave tonight to start taking advantage of these and other great discounts right away. Please be sure to stay here after our program and sample some delicious vegan foods provided by the generosity of down-to-earth natural foods. We're videotaping tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Alelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and on the first and third Thursdays of the month at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website vsh.org to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight, Vesanto Melina. Ms. Melina is a registered dietitian and co-author of Becoming Raw with Brenda Davis and the Raw Food Revolution Diet with Cherie Saria and Brenda Davis, as well as the best-selling nutrition classics, Becoming Vegan, Becoming Vegetarian, The New Becoming Vegetarian, Raising Vegetarian Children, and the Food Allergy Survival Guide. Vesanto taught nutrition at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, and at Seattle's Bastyr University. She also co-authored the joint position paper of the American Dietetic Association and Dietitians of Canada. Her presentation tonight is entitled, Raw Food Diets, What's True, What's Not? Please welcome Vesanto Melina. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Can you hear from the back? Have I got this right? Oh, good. I'm from Canada, but I've been many, many places and am very excited by really the inspirational changes that are happening in so many countries across North America and in Europe. Uh, my partner, Cam, who I'd like to thank for a lot of the help he's done in this presentation and being here too. We're just in Europe and there, there are 